The third step is to make the figures, because in scientific writing, the paper is made by the figures. So figures make or break a paper. Many people are going to simply thumb through your article when they look at the journal, and they're only going to look at your figures. So your figures need to speak for themselves. They don't need to be completely explained in the text. Another way to think about this is that the figures themselves need to tell the story. And if you have trouble making a figure, your data understanding is not complete enough yet. You're not ready to write. So figures are a good sanity check on whether you're actually ready to start writing that paper yet. As I said earlier, you should be able to follow your story just by looking at the figures. And this is a little bit out there, but don't make a figure if you can borrow it from somebody else. And that's, of course, with permission. And what I mean is don't go out to some journal and copy some data and report as your own. That's, that's a big no-no. You don't want to do that. But maybe your advisor or another student in your group has made a really nice figure. You can just modify a little bit and you can get the electronic file of it. This can save you an immense amount of time if you can do that. And trust me, your advisor is out there giving talks, writing a lot of papers. They've probably got a lot of figures that they can give you. There are some novice mistakes in making figures. Uh, don't put too much into one figure. Um, your figures are going to get shrunk down to about fist size when they're in your paper, so they have to be readable. Um, this means making your text or data points too small is a critical error. Use 14-point font that is absolute minimum. Um, nobody really cares about a photograph of your experiment. What this is saying is choose what to put in. There are things that are important to you but aren't important to the story you're telling that need to be left out of your figures. And make sure you distinguish data from theoretical fits in a figure. I hate papers where I can't figure out what they measured and what they calculated. A couple of hints are that you're going to redo your figures many times. So keep all the data you use to make the figure in the same folder as the figure, and this folder should be in the same place as all the writing for your papers. If you have all this stuff together, you're going to be happy later. Trust me. And finally, use Word. I always put in a table with invisible or white lines to order my figures in a text. And we've got some example figures. I'm going to skip over these because they don't really really uh, say much, and I'll spend too much time on them. Um, but there are good figures and bad figures. Go out to the literature and identify figures you think are very clear and ones you think are crap, and, and copy the good figures or copy the elements of the good figures. So the fourth step to actually write a paper, to put all of this into practice, is to write what you know about. And for most students, if you're starting off as a graduate student, this is the experimental section. And in fact, it may be the only section you're going to write because your advisor is going to write the rest of the paper. That's cool. You'll get more practice later on. Um, as the quote at the top of the page says, the Zen way of doing things is to do them. The way you write a paper is to write. And this means when you sit down to write, you write. Don't worry about spelling or grammar. Don't worry about putting all the references. If you can't remember some number, Put in a placeholder. I use XXX because it never appears anywhere else in my writing, and I can find and replace that later on. If you don't know a reference, put in a placeholder. If you don't like the way the writing sounds, don't worry about it. Just comment and say, rewrite this section or color it red or something, and keep writing. When you're writing, you have to actually write no matter how bad it sounds. It's very easy to get distracted, so write when you're fresh and alert, and edit your writing later in the day when you're tired or brain dead. Find the time of the day when you can actually write, and other times of day when you're going to be better off editing what you write. Um, block out several hours a day away from distractions. At home doesn't work, maybe the library. And if you get stuck in your writing, that's when it's time to go back to your outline, because you can spin your wheels for a long time, and you need to have something that is the framework of what you write to refer to, if your outline doesn't help you, you need to stop writing at this point and go back and rework your outline because your thoughts are not yet clear enough to know the order they come in and they're not reflecting the story. You've gotten sidetracked on something that's not part of your story. Story, outline, writing. Remember also that the technical writing is not a paper you're turning in for a grade. So you should expect to have many revisions done by your advisor or other people in your research group. This is all cool. This is the way we get good stuff out there. And never, never take these revisions personally, even if they seem harsh. There has got to be criticism, and it can be harsh criticism sometimes if you're ever going to develop as a good scientific writer. 
But you do need to tell your advisor if their revisions start to contradict themselves because when you give something to somebody for editing, they're going to edit it. And I know I've done this to my students and my advisor did it to me. Sometimes these changes can get circular. And these other people are busy. They're not as focused. So you say, hey, we're making changes we already made. We need to stop at this point. Um, also, I advise that if you give a paper to be read by somebody, they're going to change something. So put in a few spelling and grammar mistakes, something for your advisor to catch or other people to catch. Um, see if they're on top of their game. And of course, rename or renumber your document every single time you make a change. Disk space is cheap. It's about, what, a penny a gig these days? 10 cents a gig, something like that. Don't worry about it. Just take up a lot of disk space. So the fifth step of writing, once you've actually written this paper and edited it when you're tired, is putting in the references. Um, the rules are that anything you don't derive yourself, you need to have a reference. Um, learn how to do literature searches. This is a necessary skill. Anytime the reader could learn more by reading what you did, put in a reference. Think about a paper as trying to teach people something. And the more you keep that teaching mission in mind, the better your paper is going to be. And help your readers. If you reference a book, tell them where in the book you found this information to. The chapter, the edition of the book, even the page number will really help them focus on the information, especially if it's a big, thick textbook that's a classic in the field. Um, help your readers only cite important and relevant work. Don't just throw citations in because you think it looks good. Only steer them to the stuff you found was really good. Um, and of course, every professional organization has their own citation style. Read the style guide from their website. Um, learn how to use bibliographic software like EndNote or BibTeX. Uh, don't put in references manually. Uh, you really will regret this later in your life. Um, and then you're ready to submit. We've got it done. We've gone through the revisions. Everybody says go. You need to actually submit a paper to a journal. Um, have somebody read it over one last time particularly important if you're not a native English speaker. Format the paper using the same margins and columns as the journal. Make sure that if there are page limitations, your work is going to fit. You don't want to have to cut it later. Add a few typographic errors or minor mistakes for the reviewers to find, because they're going to find something to criticize. Uh, write the abstract. Don't go over the word limit. Think of a descriptive title, not something boring, not something so far out there that it's going to get rejected. Uh, put in the authors. The person who wrote the paper and did most of the work should be the first author, at least in my field. The advisor or the person who funded the work is going to be the final author. Make sure you acknowledge funding agencies. This is very important. And put in the reference taxonomic or classification codes that all journals require. You can find this information on the journal's website. And then you sit down and write a nice letter to the editor saying, this is why I'm submitting the paper. This is why it should be published in your journal. And here are some people who really would make very good reviewers of this work because they know about what I'm doing. And then go over the submission checklist, send in the copyright forms, and make sure you have enough money to pay for publishing the damn thing. 